The government of Venezuela denounced the vandalization of the facilities of its consular headquarters in Bogotá where a fire broke out in the early hours of Monday morning and whose acts it described as a violation of the Vienna Convention. Russian President Vladimir Putin said the country's economy manages to resist despite coercive measures imposed by the West. At least six people resulted injured in Somalia on Monday when terrorist groups attacked a parliament with mortars during a joint session in the capital Mogadishu. Hi, this is From the South. I am your news anchor Dio Martin from the Telstar Studios in Havana. We begin with the news. The government of Venezuela denounced the vandalization of the facilities of its consular headquarters in Bogotá where a fire broke out early Monday morning. The Venezuelan government described those acts as a violation of the Vienna Convention. Authorities reported that the fire broke out after homeless in the area could not control the flames of a street bonfire they had made. Firefighters also noted that the fire gained strength with the trees and waste in the area left by local residents. There were no victims to report. And Venezuela's economy is slowly recovering in the state of La Guaira, the coastal region where the nation's main air and seaports are located. Hotel occupancy was at 100% on Easter week after more than two years without operations. Madeleine Garcia has the story. To Venezuela, 30 minutes away from Caracas, the capital city. It symbolizes the resilience and resistance to the economic attack against the nation and later the financial effects of the pandemic. But there is also an immigrant story behind it. Fifty years ago, the Pereira family arrived in Venezuela from Portugal, fleeing the crisis left by the Second World War. There was no war anymore when we were grown-ups. But it is not that there was a war and that's all. It's been going on for years and years. There were no warm clothes then, no clothes. Poverty was all around. And to bet now for the country, in the name of God, we stayed here. Venezuela opened its doors to them, and they stayed here. Their children were born in the country. They could have left as migrants in the most difficult moments, but they bet everything. And in these six months, we have a great inflow of tourists. The whole state has been very active in tourism, in hotels, restaurants, in the gastronomy. We, as they say, have already touched bottom. Now Venezuela is coming up. We come with a great impulse to break all expectations and to continue working for the country. Each space has a meaning to show the best face of Venezuela. In La Guaira, according to the hotel authorities, business was at 100 percent. It has been reactivated very well and I really feel very happy because through so many bad things right now we are living something good. And we really have to enjoy the most of all this that we are living right now. It is good and to get the wire is super beautiful. I love it and it seems like we are somewhere else, but we have our own beauty right here in La Guaira. Gastronomy also embodies the flavors and smells of Venezuela. Of course we have grown. Tourists has given new opportunities to businessmen, entrepreneurs and all the people involved in everything that has to do with catering and hotel service and above all hospitality. From a four star hotel to public spaces, what Venezuelans have experienced is no small thing. And although the sea has always been a scape in the most difficult moments, it is now more fun. And the country will, thanks to God, we are moving forward. We are moving forward, improving, thanks to God. I have seen the change and I have seen a lot of improvement. Tourism has been very good. Many people have come. We have shared and everything has been very nice. The blessing of the sea with the fishermen closed Easter week with a special prayer that the country continues to move forward. Madeline Garcia, Telesur, Estado de La Guaira, Venezuela. In Colombia, workers of the national company Justo y Bueno in the city of Cucuta mobilized in the streets to demand labor guarantees and the fair payment of their salaries. The mobilization ended with a standing outside the office of the Ministry of Labor in the city of Bogota demanding wage improvements. Tony Silva, a spokesman for the workers of Justo y Bueno, explained that three months of wages were not paid, which also affects the families of the workers and demands an answer from the company. Good morning. My name is Tony Silva Correa. I am one of the spokespersons of this march. We are from the company Justo y Bueno, and we are 
in this process because we were not paid for three months. We are not paid for all health or pension. The internships that should be paid in February, we have not been paid. It is already a long time, and many of us have cut our public services. Many of us we were reported to Takreto because we have no way to pay. They keep us on bread and water practically. Then our children are also affected, our families. So we are demanding the company Justo y Bueno to please cancel us or tell us something specific, an answer, because they only tell us to be patient, and we do not live on patients. Then we are demanding an answer with our payments. In Argentina, President Alberto Fernandez held a meeting with his Ecuadorian counterpart Guillermo Lasso to strengthen bilateral relations and revitalize regional integration. At the event, the dignitaries agreed on the need to strengthen the Latin American and Caribbean states' community in order to achieve regional unity. In this context, the Argentinian leader thanked his Ecuadorian counterpart Guillermo Lasso for accompanying him in his proposal to bring Latin America together. The meeting took place at the government palace after the visit of President Guillermo Lasso, who will also visit the Secretariat of the Antarctic Treaty, located in downtown Buenos Aires City. I sincerely thank you for joining me in the proposal to unite Latin America. Even though we don't always think alike. Thank you very much, Mr. President. We're going to take a short break now. Please join us again after this. Hi and welcome back to From the South. Russian President Vladimir Putin said the country's economy manages to resist despite coercive measures imposed by the West. During a video conference to discuss economic issues, President Putin said that due to unilateral sanctions imposed by the West, additional solutions are needed to maintain a cash flow and avoid a contraction of the economy. The head of state has stated that Russia's economic situation has stabilized as evidenced by the balance of payment surplus at the end of this year's first quarter which according to Putin is $58 billion. Putin said that the country's inflation also has stabilized, although he acknowledged that the prices of some products have increased significantly in the month of April. We can now confidently say that such policy of sanctions towards Russia has failed. The economic mixed streak strategy didn't work. Moreover, the initiators themselves couldn't get away with the sanctions. I'm talking about inflation and unemployment growth and economic dynamics worsening in the U.S. and the European countries. In the past month and a half alone, consumer prices in Russia have grown by 9.4% and yearly figures number the inflation at 17.5%. I call for attention from the government and central bank colleagues. We are all very well aware of it. Those are very high figures. People feel them on their family budget. They can feel the prices growing. We must support our citizens, help them deal with the wave of inflation. Russia-Ukraine contacts continue at the expert level, but the progress is far from perfect, Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peshkov said, while he blamed the Ukrainian side for the poor progress. The Russian spokesman blamed to the Ukrainian side for the poor progress, saying they were not consistent on the agreed-upon points, and their position often changes. The official also said that the special military operation continues, commenting on a video that allegedly shows fire on the Moscow missile cruiser. He said that the Kremlin could not confirm it was authentic. The United Nations top humanitarian official Martin Griffith said Russia and Ukraine need to come together and negotiate a meaningful ceasefire so humanitarian aid can reach civilians. Corridors, convoy movements, is that two parties are not sitting together and easily blame each other when it goes wrong. And there are many of us who have opinions as to who might be to blame for one particular case. But if you don't have that kind of accountability, we know this from Syria, we know this from Yemen in particular, then it doesn't work. One. 
On Monday, Russia's Defense Ministry spokesman Major General Igor Konashenkov stated that the army destroyed a large depot of foreign weapons recently delivered to Ukraine near the western city of Lviv. High-precision air-launched missiles of the Russian airspace forces struck at the 124th Joint Logistics Support Center of the Logistic Forces Command of the Ukrainian troops in the Lviv region. The logistics center and the large batches of foreign weaponry delivered to Ukraine over the past six days by the United States and European countries have been destroyed. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa called for more adjustment measures in response to the effects of climate change after severe rains and flooding left at least 443 people dead. The leader declared a national state of disaster with the government allocating 1 billion rands for relief efforts. It is going to take a massive effort drawing on the resources and capabilities of the entire nation to recover from this disaster. As government, we will make financial resources available to meet this challenge. The Minister of Finance has said that a 1 billion rand amount is immediately available. These floods are a tragic reminder of the increasing frequency of extreme weather conditions as a result of climate change. We need to increase our investment in climate adaptation measures to better safeguard communities against the effects of climate change. Rain triggered floods killed the 443 people in South Africa's eastern province, KwaZulu Natal, according to local authorities. The heavy rains in the province damaged roads, houses, schools, power poles, and many governmental infrastructure. The continues, uh, continuous bad weather makes it difficult to search and rescue operation and cost deaths of at least one rescuer. The state of emergency was declared in KwaZulu-Natal. Relief funds and rescue materials were allocated to the province to rebuild the damaged infrastructures. The floods left another 63 people missing, and the overall economic damage was estimated at $380 million U.S. million, said Provincial Premier Silesi Kalala. We have more news coming up after one final short break. Please stay with us. Hi and welcome back. At least six people resulted injured in Somalia on Monday when terrorist groups attacked parliament with mortars during a joint session in the capital Mogadishu. The authorities reported that in the middle of a parliamentary session there was a mortar fire attack that left over six people injured. No was hit by the machine gun that landed in the fortified airport complex. So far the causes of this attack remain unreported. Likewise, parliamentarians must set the dates for the next elections on April 26, where the presidents of both legislative houses will be appointed and elected the new president to lead the country. The Iranian government accused the United States of applying delaying tactics in the Vienna Dialogues to reach an agreement on the revival of the nuclear agreement. At a press conference of the spokesman for the Iranian Foreign Ministry, Saeed Khatibzadeh declared on Monday that the pact to rescue the nuclear agreement signed with the Western powers is becoming increasingly distant due to Washington's constant delays. He stressed that there will be no compromise until there is total consensus on the remaining issues. He also called on the United States to take a political decision as soon as possible if it wants to be part of the agreement under negotiation. The government of Iran reiterated on Monday the need to reach a peaceful solution to the crisis in Syria. The statement was made by the Iranian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The authorities of that ministry pointed out that any solution on Syria must respect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of that nation. The Persian government added that they always defended this position during the Astana negotiations. Concerning the dialogue over the Persian nuclear pact, the authorities in Tehran pointed out that there will be no agreement until a consensus is reached regarding all issues.
China's economic growth sped up in the first quarter of the year to 4.8 percent, official data showed Monday. But the government warned of significant challenges ahead while massive COVID-19 lockdowns started to bite. The National Bureau of Statistics said the world's second biggest economy had lost steam in the latter half of last year with a property slump and regulatory crackdowns pulling down growth. But it exceeded expectations in the first three months of 2022 with a 4.8 percent growth. The weeks ahead, however, appear treacherous for the economy with Beijing's unrelenting zero-COVID approach to outbreaks clogging supply chains and locking down tens of millions of people. Up by 4.8 percent year-on-year at constant price, or up by 1.3 percent over the fourth quarter of 2021. The Russia-Ukraine geopolitical conflict led to a decline in production of related products, as well as increased export controls, and will impact the global supply of commodities from a demand perspective. The continued recovery of the global economy will support the growth of commodity demand. Under the expectation of supply shortage, some commodity important countries will increase the demand for stockpiling, aggravating the imbalance between supply and demand. Since the beginning of Ramadan, the Muslim fasting month, the Israeli occupation troops increased their aggressions against the Palestinian people and their places of worship, an escalation that the Arab and Muslim world condemns in addition to attacking the lives of the faithful is marked by an accused desecration of the esplanades of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. A correspondent brings us the details. Since last Friday, the troops of the Zionist regime in Tel Aviv continued their raids on the Al-Aqsa Mosque to expel the Palestinian worshippers and to protect the entrance of Jewish settlers, raids during which hundreds of Palestinians were brutally wounded or arrested. Syria, Syria, describing these Israeli attacks as inhumane and criminal, hailed the steadfastness of the Palestinian people and reaffirmed its unconditional support for the just Palestinian cause. The universal war unleashed against Syria was mainly because of its unconditional support for the Palestinian cause. And we are grateful that Syria, despite all the hardships it has suffered due to this war, remains attached to its position and demonstrates it now with a strong condemnation of this new Israeli as aggressive escalation and this determination to continue supporting us in defense of our sacraments and our rights. In addition to the deliberate profanation of the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is holy site for the entire Arab and Muslim world, Israeli forces continue their attacks on the occupied territories, an offensive that for the last 10 days left a total of 10 dead, including two women and three minors. In this situation, the Palestinians, besides condemning the international silence, affirm to stick to the resistance and the armed struggle in defense of their sacraments and their usurped rights. This new aggressive escalation both in Jerusalem and in the occupied territories is part of the hostile policy of the Zionist entity, based on assassinations, arrests, and deliberate aggressions against Muslim and Christian holy places of the Palestinian and Arab people. And what is happening now will not be able to break the Palestinian resistance. And surely the response of the resistance fighters will be immediate, hard and forceful. The current aggressive Israeli escalation seeks in flagrant violation of international law, as denounced by the Palestinian authorities, to legitimize the temporal and physical division of the Al-Aqsa Mosque, a conspiracy that the Palestinians claim will be doomed to failure knowing that they and their brothers in the Arab and Muslim world will not accept at all costs Israeli attempts to Judaize this site, considered the third holiest site for Muslims. And we've come to the end of this news brief. Remember, you can find these and many other stories on our website at Telsur English. You can also join us on social media for all the latest news from Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telsur English, I am Dio Martin. Thank you for watching.